Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Today we are going to be discussing the topic of why nations fail. And I think this is useful and important for the types of people who are here because we're thinking about different parts of the world. We're thinking about where to relocate, where to invest, where to hire people, etc. And having some idea of what determines the trajectory of a particular part of the world is going to determine you know, whether we should be investing or placing our bets there or relocating there. Obviously, there's other factors, but this is one of the big ones. So what I'm going to refer to here today is a particular mental model around how we can look at different parts of the world and somewhat project where they're going over the mid to long term. Before I do, I'd love to hear from you guys if you have ideas about what you think are the factors that determine whether one particular nation tends to thrive and succeed or tends to fail. Put them in the comments below. I will look forward to reading them over and hopefully there's some interesting insights. With that in mind, let's get started. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notifications bell. Thank you for your support and subscribing to us. If you like the video, share it with your friends, give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like help with the topics we deal with here, which are relocating abroad, international tax optimization, forming companies, opening bank accounts, investing abroad, etc., please reach out to us. You can book a call at calendly.com forward slash Michael dash Rosmer, link in the description below or send a message through our websites, offshorecitizen.net and offshorecapitalist.com. Okay, so the, the source that I'm largely going to be referencing here is uh, literally the book, <laughs> Why Nations Fail. You can go and check it out, but I'll try and give you a five minute summary of the underlying thesis, which I think is actually pretty compelling. When I started reading it, I was looking at it in comparison to others and yeah, some skepticism. They make a pretty strong case, I do think it's Maybe not complete, but on the other hand, one of the more compelling arguments out there. So how does this work? What they essentially suggest is that the principal difference between countries and the success or failure of countries is not geography, it is not culture, it is not history, it is not external factors or resources. It is principally the institutions, both the political and economic institutions that exist within that country. And they show examples of, you know, cities that the city ends up being broken apart and one is on one side of the border, the other is on the other side. One does well and one does poorly. How do you explain that with geographic factors, etc.? I think there's some counter arguments you can get into. Thomas Sowell has written about some examples that would be curious to go down. And there's definitely arguments uh, Jared Diamond has made where we can go and we can look at, okay, what is it that drives uh, the development of some of these other things? And so, you know, there's, it's, there's a multiplicity of factors, but their argument would be this is the single most important factor. And therefore, the question becomes, if it is true that the political and economic institutions are what make the biggest difference, what is the character of those institutions? They divide these into a spectrum which they refer to as extractive and inclusive institutions. So what are extractive and inclusive institutions? I think it's most easy to demonstrate if you look at the extremes. So we'll talk about the extreme of extractive institutions, which the most extreme version would be slavery. Okay? So what happens in slavery? In slavery, the work of the slaves is entirely extracted by the slave owners, meaning that they get none of the benefits of their work. And the consequence of this is they have no incentive to be more productive, they have no incentive to be inventive, they have no incentive to produce or build for the future, et cetera, because it's all going to be taken from them anyway. And the consequence of this is you develop a culture that has those incentives built into it. On the flip side, even those who are the slave owners also do not have a particularly good set of incentives because first of all, it is easier to extract from the people who uh, they are over above and they become fabulously wealthy by doing this. You can see, for example, in various different African or Eastern European, et cetera, republics, you'll have had some ruler who's incredibly rich and the people are incredibly poor and they're flying around on private jets and have mansions, places, et cetera, and there's this massive mismatch, right? So that concept of being able to extract destroys a lot of the incentives to be innovative, to be productive, et cetera. Now on top of that, even if it was true that they said, hey, we could have even more if we were to be promoting innovation and promoting production, et cetera, to do so, 
inevitably creates creative destruction. In other words, the forces of innovation potentially destabilize the power of those who are running these institutions, and therefore they are incentivized not to promote the development of that innovation, which would then result in more for everybody. So that's the idea of an extremely extractive institution. Okay? So you can just think, do the people who are producing, innovating, etc., get to benefit from it, or is it extracted? And obviously there's some spectrum. Over here on the other side, we can see people where they know that the institutions are going to protect uh, what it is they build in terms of property, in terms of intellectual property, in terms of uh, their right to do it, their ability to profit from it, et cetera. And they mentioned, say, when you look at somebody like Bill Gates, when he was starting Microsoft, he didn't have to worry about, is his company going to be taken away by the government? Are they going to steal the IP of the company, et cetera? And the consequences of this are not only is he unbounded to go out there, he can then compensate employees with stock because they're interested in the upside. They don't think that it's going to be taken away someday. Banks will finance it because they're not worried that the security will be taken away. Venture capitalists will invest and not be worried about it. And so you build this whole ecosystem which furthers the development of uh, innovation and productivity. So their argument is that these institutions do well, these ones do poorly. And as a result, you want to look to places where the institutions are more inclusive and less extractive. Now, obviously, there's some spectrum here. So to give some context, I would say, for example, that uh, commun Soviet communism was more extractive than, uh, say, Russian, uh, the Russian system at the moment, which is probably more extractive than the Chinese system at the moment which is more extractive probably than, say, the American system at the moment. So you have this spectrum, right? And we can kind of see how this has panned out in terms of the growth. I mean, we'll talk about Soviet Russia in a second, but obviously communist China over the last several decades has greatly outpaced the development in Russia. And certainly, uh, although they've been developing quite quickly, et cetera, they still have uh, had a brain drain occurring to places like Australia, UK, the US, etc. And this is where I want to look at because what a lot of people will argue is they'll say, okay, well, regulations are getting worse. These are potentially a source of extraction. Taxes maybe are getting worse depending on where you are, etc. That's a form of extraction. You have things like patent trolling in the US, frivolous lawsuits related to all kinds of different things a lot more rent seeking in terms of institutions, monopolies, because let's recognize that a, an institution that is extractive does not have to be a government, right? There were famously various different monopolies given out in UK, uh, the Dutch East India Trading Company was a monopoly, et cetera. So monopolies can be very extractive from the market as well. So you've got to kind of be aware of that. And so can various and other forms of oligopolies, regulations, et cetera, which make it, it creates a bunch of barriers to entering into a given market, all right? So typically not a good thing when you have these, uh, these extractive institutions. And you can ask, you can say, all right, well, clearly communist China in the modern day is somewhat inclusive because we can see that a large number of people are participating in it. Right? It's the greatest uh, economic miracle in history, bringing people out of extreme poverty. We can see there's a lot of billionaires being made, a lot of billionaires being made. Clearly, there's some benefits there. So where does it lie on the spectrum compared to UK, New Zealand, US, etc.? Sweden, Switzerland, you know, Singapore. And I think the first interesting indicator here is, you know, clearly those are, you know, not extremely extractive like something such as slavery. But what you do have is you have that people are leaving China regularly because they know and they're concerned that they could wake up and have everything they built taken away from them tomorrow. This is quite different from what you have in the US. Granted, we're starting to get more uncertainty in the US and people call me and want to get second citizenships and renounce, etc. But we're not at that level yet. Okay. So this is a really interesting indicator. Now, we're going to talk briefly about the counterexample that some people may have, which is, well, wasn't there tremendous growth in the Soviet Union, say, uh, under Stalin and afterwards, which is true. If you look uh, under Stalin and in the few decades 
falling. We're talking about, I believe it was an average of about 6.5% per year GDP per capita growth, which is really high. And so how does that happen? And the way they explain it in the book is if you have extractive institutions, you can still have growth for sure. If what's happening is they're able to reallocate large amounts of resources from an unproductive area to a productive one in, to an extent and with a, a fervor that the normal market would not push. In the case of Stalin, what he did was he saw that agriculture, which was, it was mostly an agrarian society at the time, was non-productive and industrialization was more productive. And he famously starved people and reallocated massive amounts of resource from the agricultural sector to the industrialization of the country. And that boosted productivity dramatically, really quickly. The problem was that since the systems didn't build the right incentives in place, and those incentives really are best guided by the market, kind of the invisible hand thing, because it's extremely complex. It, because of that, it wasn't, the, the industrialization was not done as productively as it would be in other parts of the world, and eventually the growth kind of ground to a halt, which we saw in around the 70s. So that's sort of the narrative. And they go through lots of different examples. They talk about uh, in Venice, they talk about in Rome, they talk about uh, Spain versus UK, they talk about what happened in uh, the US versus Mexico, looking at different parts of Latin America, etc. Quite an interesting tapestry of different parts of the world. So the thing I think is worth noting is where are the parts of the world where you have inclusive economic and political systems? These are ones where virtually, essentially anyone can participate, right? They aren't exclusionary. They aren't extractive, or at least the degree of extraction is minimized so that people can actually benefit from what it is they're doing. They know that they have protection of the rule of law, both their private property, intellectual property. They have uh, basically this system that is going to offer them security and they can gain, take those gains. Where are those places in the world today? I'd be curious to hear what you guys think in terms of which places are most inclusive, both politically and economically, and noting, that is to say the institutions, and noting also, by the way, that there's a difference between, like, a democracy is not necessarily an inclusive political and economic institution. Meaning you can have highly extractive democracies, just like you can have uh, authoritar authoritarian or centralized governments that are extremely inclusive in terms of the political and economic institutions. It's that question of, are we taking from you so that we're destroying your incentives and rebalancing society in this way that is uh, less practical? And obviously, you know, you can play around with the argument of, okay, once you start to get past a certain stage, how much does it matter? And, you know, is it a big deal that Denmark taxes higher than Sweden? You know, that's a whole other conversation, but I'd love to hear what are the places that you think are most inclusive, which places are improving in their inclusivity, and which are becoming more extractive. I will look forward to seeing you on the next video.